For the past two months, we have been looking at the life of Joshua, the successor to Moses, whom God commissioned to lead the people of Israel into the land he had promised them after their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Under Moses, the people had made a covenant with God to worship him alone and keep his commandments. The people failed to keep that covenant. So they spent 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai before eventually arriving at the River Jordan. At God's direction, Joshua led the people over the River Jordan and they began the conquest of the land of Canaan, which God had promised them. There were nu numerous people groups living there already and it was God's purpose that Israel should drive them out and settle there themselves. Why did God want to drive out the people already living there? It was because those people groups, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, to name only a few, did not worship the one true God who created the universe, but had their own gods who were considered in charge of the weather and the fertility of the land. Many of these gods had the title Baal, and their worship often included sex as well as sacrifices. The Canaanites and other tribes were examples of the human race which had turned its back on the one true God. God had chosen Israel to be his special people. He was preparing them to receive the savior, Jesus, who would deliver the whole of humanity. It was a long process but it was essential that Israel should keep itself pure, hence the command to drive out the inhabitants of the land so that they would not be corrupted. While Joshua was leading the people, some of this was completed, but not all. After his death, and after that whole generation had passed away, the Israelites forgot their covenant with God again. Rather than drive out the other people groups, as God had commanded them to, they settled down with them and started to intermarry with them. Most significantly, they began to worship the gods of the people around them, the Baals. This was entirely contrary to God's plan to redeem mankind. Israel had again broken God's covenant with them. This had consequences. Because they did not drive out the other tribes, those tribes attacked and subjugated them. And Israel cried out to God to save them. So God raised up leaders called judges to deliver them from their enemies. One of these was a woman called Deborah, whose story is our message for today. I'm now going to read chapter four of Judges section by section, and comment on it. Verses 1 to 3. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Caesar, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim, because he had nine chariots, 900 iron, 900 giant iron chariots, and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. And I've asked Isaac to put up a map to show where these places are. Hope you can see them. The Israelites on their own did not have much of a chance against the superior power of Jabin, king of Canaan. He had 900 chariots fitted with iron as part of his fighting force under the command of his general, Caesar. We're not told how many chariots the Israelites had, if they had any at all, but they would have been made of wood. The Israelites didn't stand a chance against these iron chariots. We are told that with their superior power, 
the Canaanites cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. This would involve tribute, forced labor, and other things. In desperation, the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Now I'm going to read Judges 4, 4 to 11. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And Israelites came to her to have their disputes settled. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you, go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Caesar, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Caesar over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zarnanim near Kadesh. Here we are introduced to Deborah. She's described as a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is a person who receives a direct message from God to relay to, relay to God's people. It very often concerned events which would happen in the future with instructions about what to do. She was also a judge. The judges at this time did more than settle disputes between people or tribes. They were also leaders of their people more generally. We are told that Deborah held court in the tribe of Ephraim's territory under a particular palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country. There's another map. You see towards the, the bottom of the picture, that's where uh, Deborah lived. And towards the north was where Barak was. There he will meet Caesar, the commander of the Canaanite army, with all his chariots and troops at the river Kishon. I see a map of the river Kishon. You can, you can see it, a line. Can we have it again, please, Isaac? Yes, there. You can, you can see uh, where the river Kishon is between those two little blue dots. The Lord will enable Barak to defeat Caesar and his troops in spite of their superior numbers and equipment. It would appear that Barak was very diffident about his ability to defeat Caesar and the Canaanite army. From a human point of view, it did look impossible. But the message had come from the Lord through Deborah. So Barak hedges his bets by saying he would do it if Deborah goes with him. It seems he trusted Deborah more than the word from the Lord at this point. But Deborah has no doubts about God's capability to defeat Caesar and affirms that she will certainly go with Barak to the battle. But there will be consequences for Barak. The honor of the victory will not go to Barak, but to a woman. So Deborah accompanies Barak to Kadesh, where Barak summons his army and they set out for Mount Tabor, with Deborah going with them. 
Verse 11 tells us about a certain Heber of the Kenite tribe who had moved away from the rest of his family, pitched his tent near a large tree near Kadesh and allied himself with Jabin king of the Canaanites. We will see the significance of this later. Suffice it, suffice it to say for the moment that the Kenites were the in-laws of Moses, so they had links with the Israelites. In verses 12 to 16, we have a description of the battle. So I'll read verses 12 to 16. When they told Caesar that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Caesar had gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him from Harasheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Caesar into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Caesar and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Caesar abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagoyim. All the troops of Caesar fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Barak had taken all his troops to, ma to Mount Tabor, according to the Lord's command through Deborah. And I'd like Isaac to show us a picture of Mount Tabor. There you can see it. It's a modern picture, but it at least gives you an idea what Mount Tabor looked like and the plain below. A mountain is not a suitable area for chariots. So Caesar assembled his Canaanite troops with their iron chariots in the valley below near the river Kishon. But the river valley was not ideal for chariots, heavy with iron, because the earth beneath them was soft. Also, we learn from chapter five of Judges that the Lord sent a storm which caused the river to flood and the chariot wheels got stuck in the mud. The Israelites with their light armor rushed down Mount Tabor and attacked them and Caesar's army was routed. They fled in the direction of Harasheth Hagoyim and they were all killed. Caesar fled north on foot. After the victory, Deborah and Barak, Barak sing a song which gives more details of the victory. I will read parts of the first half of it from Judges chapter five. So I'll read Judges five verses one to 23. On that day, Deborah and Barak son of Abinoam sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. O oh Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the roads were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Village life in Israel ceased, ceased until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. When they chose new gods, war came to the city gates and not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road, consider the voices of the singers at the watering places. They recite the righteous acts of the Lord 
the righteous acts of his warriors in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, O Barak. Take captive your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then the men who were left came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came to me with the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, rushing after him into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires <clears throat> to, to hear the whistling of the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives. So did Naphtali on the heights of the field. Kings came, they fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tarnak by the waters of Megiddo. But they carried off no silver, no plunder. From the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Caesar. The river Kishon swept them away. The age old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horse's hoofs, galloping, galloping, go his mighty steeds. Curse Meroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its people bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. The song begins with praise to the Lord <clears throat> and an acknowledgement that the victory was due to his intervention. The next verses describe some of the harsh conditions the Israelites were living under, that they could not even take direct routes from one place to another, but had to take winding paths to avoid attack. Then God chooses new leaders under Deborah, a mother in Israel. The tribes of Israel are called to attack the enemy. Some respond and some don't. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, Naphtali and Zebulun are the chief responders. But also Ephraim, Benjamin, and the western half of the tribe of Manasseh also contributed soldiers. But the tribes on the eastern side of the River Jordan, plus Dan and Asher on the Mediterranean coast, did not and are shamed. Then we have the description of the battle itself and how the kings of Canaan were defeated and how the rain and the river contributed to that defeat. The Lord was fighting with Israel. Verses 17 to 24 of chapter four describe the aftermath of the battle and what happened to Caesar as a Canaanite general. I will read verses 17 to 24 of chapter four and verses 24 to 27 of the Song of Deborah in chapter five, which gives more detail. Caesar, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber, Kenite. Jael went out to meet Caesar and said to him, come my Lord, Come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said, please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. 
She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Caesar and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay, lay Caesar with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. And now from chapter, chapter 5, beginning at verse 24. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, most blessed of tent-dwelling tent women. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Caesar, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, there he lay. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Now I have a confession to make. I have to say that when I read how Jael killed the Canaanite king Caesar, I felt yuck. Then I said to myself, Sheila, you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, don't you? Is this your reaction? All the more so because Jael is praised for her action. She is called most blessed of women, most blessed of tent dwelling women. Maybe some of you feel like this too. As I have reflected on this and sought the Lord's guidance, here are, the here are the conclusions I came to. We need to remember the context of this story. At this time, Israel was God's special people whom he was preparing to receive the Messiah. And the Canaanites were attacking them and oppressing them. The Canaanites were in rebellion against the God of the universe. God, in his grace and goodness, was delivering Israel from Canaanite oppression. And Caesar was a Canaanite general fleeing from the battle. He sought refuge in Jael's tent because Jael's husband Heber had made an alliance with the king of the Canaanites. So he thought he was safe. But Jael remembered that her people, the Kenites, were related by marriage to the Israelites through Moses. And she was on the side of the Israelites. In this instance, on God's side, what she did was a very brave thing to do, even though it was breaking all the rules of hospitality. And Caesar's death would have been almost instantaneous. By her action, the rout of the Canaanites was complete. The situation now is very different since the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus came to inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth, on this earth. And the kingdom of God is open to all peoples. It is not a national or a political kingdom. When Jesus was being cross-examined by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. The kingdom of God will be fully realized when Jesus returns. Hence, he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Unfortunately, down the centuries, people haven't understood this and have tried to impose their version of Christianity on others by force. The celebration of Bonfire Night on Friday is one such instance. Guy Fawkes and his fellow conspirators intended to blow up the King and Parliament 
on November the 5th, 1606, in order to restore the Catholic faith in England. I apologize for this little digression, but I hope it will help some of you to understand the scripture better. Now we will return to Deborah, who is the main topic of our message today. Deborah was a remarkable woman. She was outstanding in her faith in God. When God told her to do something, she did it. No excuses, no turning back. When the Lord told her to send for Barak and tell him that he was to lead Israelite forces against the Canaanites and that he would defeat them, she did so. It was not an easy message to tell an oppressed people to go to Mount Tabor and attack the Canaanites who had sub subjugated them for the last 20 years and that they would win because the Lord their God would give them victory. Deborah was a woman of faith. She believed implicitly that what God had said he would do. She was obedient to his word to her. She was courageous and went with Barak to the place of battle and stayed with the troops during it. She was a support to Barak, whose faith was much weaker than hers. When the battle was won, she gave the glory and praise to God. Deborah was known for this faith and knowledge of God's will, even before the command to go into battle against the Canaanites. She was known for her wisdom and closeness to God because people would go to her with their problems from all the regions where the Israelites were living and she would decide their cases and settle their disputes. People would go long distances to see her because she lived in the south central part of the promised land and people would go to her even from the far north of the country. Her judgment and integrity were trusted. Deborah was one of the most influential women in the Bible. As a prophet and a judge, she heard God's word and shared it with others. She also has the distinction of being the only judge of whom nothing negative is said. What lessons does the story of Deborah have for us today? One important lesson is that God does call women to have leadership roles among God's people, the church. He gives gifts to women as well as to men and calls on them to use those gifts to accomplish his will. This is important because there are churches which deny leadership roles to women and restrict them to teaching only women and children and to dealing with refreshments and clearing up afterwards. I'm thankful that our church is not like this. We have women on our leadership team. I am grateful to Pastor Rupert, who shares his pulpit and calls upon several of us women to preach on a Sunday morning. I count it a privilege. Deborah is not the only woman prophet in the Bible. Miriam, Moses' sister, is described as a prophet, but we're not told much about what she did. Then there is another woman prophet called Haldah, whom King Josiah, who reigned from 640 to 609 BC, con he consulted her after the book of the law, law of God was found during repairs to the temple in Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary brought Jesus as a baby to the temple in Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, there was a prophetess called Anna who came up to them and in the words of Luke, gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who are looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. The prophet Joel, speaking of the time when God would send the Holy Spirit, said, and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21 and verses eight to nine, 
we learn of the four daughters of Philip the Evangelist who prophesied. In the early church, both men and women exercised the gift of prophecy. We read this in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11 and verse 5. In his letters, the Apostle Paul makes mention of several women who served in their churches. There is a woman called Phoebe, who is described as a deacon of the church in Cenchreae in Greece. He speaks of a couple called Priscilla and Aquila as his fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They are also mentioned in Acts chapter 18. It is interesting that Priscilla is the one nearly always mentioned first. So my sisters and brothers, be encouraged. The Lord calls whom he wills into ministry, women as well as men. What is required of all of us is to be obedient to the call of God, whatever he asks us to do. He will empower us by his spirit to accomplish it. As the Apostle John said, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. <laughs>